Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, we're very excited to have you with us. I know people are slowly coming in and um, we have over 150 people registered for this today, which I think is pretty phenomenal given that it is a Wednesday in July. And so I, uh, we all thank you for being here today and showing your interest um, on our research on rural Minnesota and working with refugees and immigrants. Um, my name is Julie Tesh and I'm the president and CEO of the Center for Rural Policy and Development. And again, it's very happy to have you all here today. I'm gonna put up my screen quick to just give you a quick background. I know many of you um, have participated in our webinars before and thank you for coming back. And I also know that we have many new people as well. So I just want to give a quick overview of, of what we're doing today and what it's looking like. Um, the Center for Rural Policy and Development, we were created in 1997. And we were created basically to, oops, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We were created to do research on behalf of rural Minnesota. So we take those topics like healthcare or immigration, um, child care and look at it from a rural lens because we know that policy does look different. So what what looks what might work in Minneapolis and St. Paul or Cottage Grove might look different in Austin or Wasika or Red Lake Falls. And so we try to put that research to work and find it from a rural lens. And so that that's all we do. Um, I'm biased, but I think we do it pretty darn well. And so we're a nonprofit of our own, and we have a board of directors of 19 uh, board members. The majority of them are appointed by the governor's office, but we also have um, uh, a few that the board appoints as well. Um, and I think the most important thing is that we are nonpartisan. Um, we, the research is the research, and, and my staff and I uh, stand by that wholeheartedly. And I need to uh, change this uh, slide actually, we have four staff members now in our home offices. And so um, we have myself here. I am in rural Wasika County near the town of Waldorf. We have Marnie Werner, who is our VP of research. She is in Mankato. Kelly Ash, who is a research associate, he is in New London. And then newest on our team is Whitney Oaks. And she is living in St. Paul with hopes getting back to uh, rural Minnesota. Um, if you have not signed up for our newsletter or are not aware of us on social media, here's where you can check us out. Always just look for Rural MN or Rural Policy MN. We do a monthly newsletter and we would love to have you subscribe. We promise not to spam you. Um, we send out a monthly newsletter and then also we send out notices about these webinars. We, we do webinars about once a month, depending upon our research schedule. And then also you can go to our YouTube channel and check out all of the previous webinars that we've had. They are all listed up there and all up there. And this one will be up there as well in the next coming days. So today you're all here joining us to talk about rural policy and how local municipalities, local towns are working with immigrant and refugee populations. And the way that this is going to go is I'm going to turn it over to Whitney Oaks and Justin Moore here in a couple minutes. And they're going to go through the actual research report. And, um, and then after that, we're going to be having this fabulous panel, as you can see here, Obala Obala from the Austin City Council. And uh, he is a, an award-winning council member, Obala, congratulations on receiving, I believe it's Outstanding Refugee um, in 2020. So congratulations to Obala on that. We also have Sarah Karki from Austin Area Minority Business Project, and then Martha Castagnon, um, with the Immigrant, Immigrant Law Center, and she is also a CRPD board member. So very happy to have all three of them on today. But first, we're going to be hearing from Whitney Oaks and Justin Moore. They just both uh, finished up their Master's of Public Policy at the University of Minnesota. And I want to give a great big thank you to the University of Minnesota uh, Humphrey School of Public Affairs for partnering with us on this. Um, our staff worked hand in hand with Whitney and, and her team, and we are just so excited for this report and how it's getting noticed and getting out there. And um, just, just thank you. And we hopefully we can work with them again in the future. So 
without further ado, I am going to turn it over and stop sharing my screen. Um, I am pleased to introduce, oh, actually before, just quickly too, before, we encourage you to use the chat feature. If you have any questions throughout, please put it in the chat. Also feel free to chat with one another. Um, we'll be fielding questions at the end and, and also throughout, but um, we'll be monitoring those questions. So please feel free if something pops in your head, put it in the chat and, and, or in the Q&A and we'll get it out there. So without further ado, thank you again for being here today. I am going to turn it over to Whitney Oaks, our contract researcher. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, it's really exciting to present this project that uh, I helped to work on to uh, finish my Master of Public Policy this spring with my colleague Josiah Moore, as well as Izzy Galen and Ryan Redmer, who are not with us today, but very important members of the team. And our report is called Building Community, Embracing Difference immigrants, refugees, and local government outreach in rural Minnesota. And this project we completed as a capstone thesis report for the Humphrey School, but we partnered with the Center for Rural Policy, as well as the Council for Asian Pacific Minnesotans, Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage, and the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs. This is really a group endeavor um, throughout and so so such big thanks to everyone who who worked on this project with us as it's really important as our as our communities change and, and grow together. So here I have just a little graph to show how per, the percent of total population that is foreign born has really exploded uh, across Minnesota. So diversity has been growing for decades in the state of Minnesota, rural Minnesota included. But in the last 20 years, especially, we've seen an even larger increase in immigration from immigrants and refugees, particularly in greater Minnesota with the meatpacking plants. And so for this project, we chose four rural communities that have representation of Asian Pacific Minnesotans, of Minnesotans from African heritage and Latino Minnesotans. Because we were partnering with these organizations, we wanted to choose cities where there was a substantial amount of each of these communities present so we could kind of get a better overview of the state of diversity, inclusion, and outreach in the state of Minnesota. So here you can see the four communities that we really looked at in this study, um, Austin in Maurer County, Pelican Rapids in Ottertail County, Wilmer in Candy Ojai, and Worthington in Nobles County. And you know there are there are regions across Minnesota that have seen a drastic increase in diversity in the last 20 years, but these four in particular have a lot of commonalities. Um, all four are meatpacking towns, and uh, the the meatpacking industry in each area is not only the largest employer and economic driver in each region, each region, but also most of the employees on the meatpacking plant uh, floor are immigrants and refugees. And so there's a lot of commonalities, despite the differences in, in rurality and size and in community. And what we wanted to look at in particular in our study was the local government side of the equation of diversity and inclusion. So the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs published a really amazing report that I highly recommend you all check out called Latino Minnesotans in the Time of COVID-19. And what this did is outlined a lot of important issues that were coming up in our immigrant and refugee populations across the state. Although it, def it definitely focused on Latino Minnesotans, there's enough commonalities between these groups, particularly uh, when considering in greater Minnesota, that it was a really great proxy for, you know, what do immigrants and refugees say they need or aren't getting or are getting and enjoying in each town. And so what we did in our report is ask local government officials, both at the municipal and the county level, about their outreach and inclusion efforts, as well as just the state of their communities, uh, what their communities were looking like, were people getting along, what was the community, the nature of community cohesion in these areas. And 
we found some really interesting things. We have quite a few findings. Um, and so for this presentation here, we wanted to keep it brief because the panelists are definitely the star of the show. But what we found in our four communities that we looked at was this emphasis in the need for housing, uh, an emphasis on the asset-based outlook. So what immigrants and refugees bring to the table in these rural Minnesota communities, as well as um, challenges in building capacity particularly in rural areas without a lot of resources to give to diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, and so without further ado, we'll start on some of the stuff we found in talking to local government officials. You know, anyone who's familiar with issues in rural Minnesota knows that housing is an issue there. It's an issue everywhere. We need more housing and more affordable housing across the state. But rural Minnesota faces particular challenges that both affect the community writ large, but also specifically affect immigrants and refugees. And so we kind of have this section here set up uh, in, in two parts. So first about the challenges of um, constructing and developing new housing in rural Minnesota, and second, how that relates to immigrant and refugee needs. So one of the things that came up in almost every interview we had was this need for more housing, particularly in areas that are now growing because of immigrant and refugee in migration. And so while there's rural communities across the state whose populations are, are in decline, areas with significant increases in uh, immigrant and refugees are, are growing. These rural towns are expanding and expanding rapidly. And as such, we need improvements to the housing stock to accommodate um, all these new folks and their families and, and that sort of thing. But the challenge that we're facing is that in rural Minnesota, we have lower land values and this high cost of materials. So the cost of materials for housing is expanding. And with lower land values, there's, lower, there's a lower amount of money that you can get back for developing in rural areas. So often developer, developers will, will opt to uh, build housing in suburban and, and urban environments, which makes sense for them when they're thinking about their profit margin. But what about these communities where the housing stock is aging and aging rapidly and doesn't necessarily fit with the community needs anymore? Um, one of the issues too is that in rural Minnesota, we do need smaller developments than say in Minneapolis. And so it's another reason that developers are not super enticed to come to our areas. And one interesting thing that I found in our interviews was that subsidized housing or affordable housing in kind of the way we typically frame it, like subsidized housing is insufficient for the needs. Because most of the immigrants and refugees in the communities we studied are working on the meatpacking floor, they make too much money to actually qualify for like Section 8 or, or that type of housing. And so what we really need is market rate housing in these areas, but are having a really hard time uh, figuring out uh, how to bring that to light. And so now I'm going to pass it off to Josiah, who's going to talk a little bit more about how um, housing in particular affects our immigrant and refugee populations in rural Minnesota. Thank you, Whitney. Uh, so one thing we heard about immigrant and refugee housing needs, uh, is something many are probably familiar with, is that uh, larger housing for commonly multi-generational families is a big need uh, in these communities. Um, we had uh, several interviewees tell us, you know, our housing stock was just developed for a different kind of family than we're seeing now. A lot of smaller homes, uh, especially when most of the housing stock in rural communities was built, homes were being built smaller uh, and, and uh, apartments that are one or two bedrooms. Um, whereas for these multi-generational families, we're seeing needs for more three and four bedroom units. Um, and we've seen some situations, uh, like we were told of one in Pelican Rapids, uh, where they were building some workforce housing for the employees at West Central Turkeys. And the developer came together with the city uh, and West Central Turkeys to discuss, you know, what can we do to make sure this housing fits uh, your workforce's needs? And they said, well, we need a lot of larger units uh, 
for this particular workforce. And it was a case where they were able to get it done with a new development uh, that actually had a lot of three and four bedroom units. Um, so that was a great success story we heard uh, in the course of our research for really understanding what the community needs are, partnering uh, with, with other, you know, with people in the locality who had a stake in what was going on to make sure needs were met. Um, but of course, those needs are still still there and still hard to address. Um, just because Pelican Rapids was able to do it uh, with one development doesn't make it easy for everyone. You know, uh, there's trade-offs with going with more units. That means with, uh, with larger units, that means less units overall. And it can be difficult to get the sort of revenue that makes that development viable. So there certainly are challenges in meeting these needs. We can go to the next slide, Whitney. Uh, so with the general uh, difficulty in attracting developers to rural areas and just meeting the needs in the house in crisis, as well as the specific of refugee and immigrant communities in, in rural Minnesota, um, our team built some recommendations around the idea of manufactured homes uh, and that uh, you may be familiar with the term mobile homes uh, or mobile home parks. Uh, and we wanted to delve into this because we saw perhaps a bit of a disconnect in the way mobile homes and manufactured homes were viewed uh, by localities and by interviewees versus uh, what they could offer a community uh, as far as uh, being a source of housing that could be developed uh, affordably uh, and at a lower cost than any other type when that is uh, sort of what everyone's asking for is how can we find something uh, that we can develop at a low enough cost that can meet people's needs and this seemed like an answer. Um, so why does it meet refugee needs? Why do we, why do we say that? We, well, if you look at the price per square foot, uh, it's about half that of a traditional single family home build. So you can get size in a manufactured home, the sort of size that a refugee or immigrant family might need for a much lower price than you can if you're building a traditional single family home. Um, people might worry that the home would be low quality, but ever since changes to standards uh, in the mid seventies, uh, manufactured homes rival the quality of traditional built homes. So it's sort of a, sort of a conception of mobile homes that it would be helpful for us to get past uh, and perhaps be able to meet some needs in our communities. The other reason this might meet immigrant and refugee needs is because families in mobile home parks in Minnesota are already more likely to be people of color. Our immigrants, refugees, second generation, uh, people of color otherwise, they're already concentrated in these mobile home parks. A great example of this is Sun Gold Heights in Worthington, Minnesota, which is cooperatively owned by residents uh, and the residents are uh, Hispanic and the residents are Hispanic and Asian Pacific Islander residents, 60% of whom work at the, uh, the JBS plant uh, there in Worthington. Um, uh, we can go to the next slide here, Whitney. Um, so we are seeing some uh, mobile home park expansion in the state, and this is sort of a new trend uh, that, that makes this a little more viable and makes this a bit more of a uh, topical discussion. Uh, we're seeing mobile home park expansions currently in St. Francis, Ham Lake, St. Anthony, and Rosemount, Minnesota. And what these are is existing mobile home parks uh, finally were able to get approval from their local city councils to expand their lots, um, some by as many as 50 lots, so 50 new homes, some smaller expansions. Um, and this is different. Uh, the one in St. Anthony, for example, they applied for the same expansion in 2017, but didn't get it. Um, but it seems like city councils are starting to say, you know, this housing crisis and our need to build and our need to develop, it's sort of overcoming in some cases, the aversion to mobile homes or manufactured homes uh, that many localities have had for the last 30, 40 years. Um, Finally, a note on manufactured homes is they're already the largest source of natu naturally occurring affordable housing in the state. So like Whitney said, a lot of times these employees, immigrants and refugees, they don't qualify for Section 8, but they can 
there's nothing preventing them from being able to go into a really affordable home like this uh, because there's no subsidy you need to qualify for for these most of the time. But uh, we can go to the next slide here, Whitney. Uh, so the second part of our report that we'll be going into today is sort of this capacity building. When we say that, we're talking about sort of capacity building for, for being welcoming communities uh, to immigrant and refugee uh, people. And, and that sort of involves, you know, getting representation on city councils, uh, on commissions, representation in the workforce, like the police force and educators. There'll be signs of sort of a welcoming community. And the communities we spoke with um, all valued welcoming immigrants and refugees across the board. Um, and what we saw was they, they saw that there was work to be done in translating those values into action. One city council member told us that they'd been on the city council since 2013 and they'd always talked about, wow, we really need to get diversity into uh, our city hall, but we just haven't been able to do it. And, and the person was sort of doubting if they were really committed to that, that value. Um, there's also work to be done in building consensus around welcoming values. It's sort of different in every locality, right? They're, they're not uh, homogenous. You know, Austin passed a, a, a resolution to join Welcoming America, uh, you know, to, to an organization that is all about welcoming refugees and immigrants. They passed it unanimously, whereas Wilmer, had more of a split vote 5-2 on just passing sort of a, a welcoming resolution in their city. Um, so we just want to acknowledge that there's there's different political situations in each in each locality as far as you know what it looks like to have these values of welcoming Im immigrants and refugees. Uh, but in each city, regardless of the political situation, there are existing assets and communities for welcoming immigrants and refugees that have been created. And we're gonna talk about some of those on the next slide here. Um, so one of the biggest assets that we wanna talk about here is these, we call them inclusion focused commissions. Uh, in each of the four cities we, we studied, they have a sort of an inclusion focused commission that focuses on immigrants and refugees or, or this sort of work. So in Austin, it's the Human Rights Commission. Um, and they have done sort of a, they, they've built, Sort of a professionalized model into their human rights commission where their their commission developed a strategic plan and that strategic plan uh, resulted in the creation of several initiatives uh, that are that are in practice now because the city council chose to adopt them such as the honorary council member position uh, that i'm sure obala could tell us uh, more about uh, as we get into panel questions in Wilmer, you have a Human Rights Commission and Vision 2040 that both have been doing sort of work that's around including inclusion of immigrants and refugees. Um, one thing we've seen from them is sort of a, a anti-racism statement going out. In Pelican Rapids, we've seen their multi multicultural committee uh, put together several uh, community events uh, as sort of their model of what they do. Um, and in Worthington, they have a brand new cross-cultural advisory committee that but still forming, uh, you know, what they're going to be because it was just approved in, in 2020 at the end there. Uh, so we're seeing these wonderful assets um, that these communities have in existence, uh, which is just great to see. And, and as we move into sort of looking forward, Whitney's going to talk more about some ideas we have for, for what people could, what could be done with these commissions. Thank you so much, Josiah. Yeah, so, you know, this report that we completed as part of the capstone, it's really just the first step in this much larger um, research agenda that we want to do here at the center that, you know, is investigating these changes and, you know, hoping to support um, increased community cohesion, community togetherness and, and representation. And so when it comes to moving forward and uh, the report that I am working on in this follow-up report, our central question is how can rural communities build capacity for equity and inclusion outreach and improve diverse representation in local governments? And so we have these questions here that kind of remain to be studied, particularly through 
um, you know, these commissions and this increased representation. And so one of the first questions we still uh, kind of have and want to flesh out is, how can we promote communication and collaboration between municipalities and counties? So one issue that comes up when we're talking about capacity is resource distribution. I mean, you know, rural counties, rural cities, they already have a lot on their plate and they have a lot of um, things mandated by the state, you know, that they already have to do. And so don't have as much um, funding or even uh, people to perform that kind of outreach and inclusion that, that needs to be done and that our interviewees recognized. And so how can we um, promote having relationships across greater Minnesota where people can talk to one another and hear what other folks are doing? One thing that I heard a lot while doing interviews was you know, we don't really know what to do. <laughs> like, it's a lot of a lot of people in the city and county level working in government and public institutions. It's it's a lot of um, white folks, a lot of older residents, people who have you know, who have their hearts in the right place because they view immigrants and refugees as the assets that they are, but don't necessarily know how to move forward or how to increase representation. And so we heard often this kind of feeling at a loss in in how to perform the activities that they want to perform. And so we think one way would be increased communication uh, between these cities to share resources, to share ideas, um, even between the commissions that already exist, if there is some form of communication between them, right? Like what can we find out? What can we grow together? And then also how can we advocate that at the state level as a rural Minnesota coalition for these additional resources that we need for you know things like language translation. Um, another question that we have is how can we implement uh, commissions and honorary city council seats to build capacity? Um, I think Austin has a great example of this. Josiah brought it up. I'm sure you know we'll talk to Obal about this in a moment. But you know, how can we encourage uh, communities to implement these honorary city council seats where that way you don't necessarily need to win an election to have a seat at the table and to get involved in local governance, particularly as we're thinking about, you know, refugees. And if you if you grew up perhaps or spent a long time in a refugee camp, you might not necessarily understand how a governance here works. And that's like not their fault whatsoever. So it's up to us, like as the governing institutions, to make sure that there's these avenues for access so that people can have a seat at the table, learn how things work, and also get their ideas out there. Because um, a lot of these communities do kind of exist in silos. Like uh, what we heard from interviews was, oh, well, a lot of the Latinos will hang out with other Latinos and the Somali folks will hang out with other Somali folks and same with the Karen. And so how can one way to, to bridge those gaps, right, is to have this diverse representation to say, oh, well, if we have say Obala at the table, who can he connect us with um, that we might not have had uh, connections with otherwise? Thirdly, we have how can we reevaluate hiring requirements through a skills based lens to increase diversity. And so this was one really interesting thing for me personally was I often heard in our interviews that well we really want to hire diverse candidates, but we require a four year degree and not there's not as many applicants with a four year degree from these diverse backgrounds. Well, if we reevaluate our hiring standards and think about the skills that these folks are bringing to the table, whether that be the fact that they are likely fluent in multiple languages, like we have connections in areas where we need to build more connections within the community. Um, we, if we look at it through a skills-based lens of, okay, what skills do immigrants and refugees inherently bring to the table that we don't have in our local government and our public institutions right now? You know, perhaps there isn't this need to make sure that everyone has a four year degree who's applying or getting these positions. Even, um, and this also uh, applies to code enforcement, something we heard a lot about is policing and code enforcement and how, you know, sometimes it is hard to communicate with a family, say in Wilmer, that, you know, maybe they're violating the code by having like stuff in their yard that isn't technically supposed to be there. Well, how are we supposed to communicate with them if? You know, we don't have a shared language or shared understanding. Well, you know, if we adjust these hiring requirements, then we'll have community members 
who are more attuned to the different cultures that exist within their own community and thus can better communicate and collaborate together. And lastly, this question that we're still exploring is how can we support diverse entrepreneurs and young people to provide opportunities outside of meatpacking and agricultural employment? I think Sarah will likely be able to um, talk to this as the Austin Area, my, Austin Area Minority Business Council is, you know, we're seeing a lot, especially restaurants um, opened by immigrants and refugees that really um, are adding so much culture to any given area. I mean, you go to Austin, you can get uh, better ethnic food in Austin than in lots of places like a, around the state, right? So how can we support those entrepreneurs while also with young people show them that there are opportunities for them that don't just mean entering the meatpacking floor right out of high school. There's obviously there is dignity in every single job that you know that people work. And so if you want to go into meatpacking, that is great. Like that's what your parents do. Also, we, we need to make sure that we're not pigeonholing these, these young people of color in these towns into um, you know, filling these roles that we expect them to fill? How can we make sure that they know all of the opportunities that are out there for them if they, if they want to pursue them? And so these are the questions that um, myself and others will be exploring as the center, you know, expands upon this original uh, research. And one other comment I wanted to make was about language differences. So in our report, we heard a lot about how it's really hard to build community when there are so many languages present. There are literally hundreds of languages spoken in greater Minnesota. And even among Latinos, Spanish isn't always the first language. Often Spanish is the second language after maybe their indigenous language. And so it's, it's truly impossible, right, for cities and counties to translate every government document into every language that we have spoken um, or read, and then also distribute them to the right people. And so that's not necessarily an option. We don't have the resources or the capacity. And it also just takes too much time when instead, if we had these diverse community leaders already present in our local institutions, then we can build those bonds without that need of all these extra resources for language translation for things that we, we, don't, we don't know will even get into the right hands. And so, while we have more findings to talk about, those all can be found um, on Rural MN's website where our report is found. We really want to open this up to the panelists uh, now. And, and one thing I wanted to say really quickly before we do that is that while a lot of our interviewees speak about immigrants and refugees like they are very new members of the community, the fact is, is that Immigrants and refugees have been vital to the state of Minnesota for generations. And I have a little muted video here playing that actually features one of our uh, panelists, uh, Martha Castagnon, um, up talking about that, about how immigrants and refugees have always been vital to the economy and vitality of greater Minnesota, even when they were maybe in smaller numbers than they are now. And that even though this might seem like a new trend to a lot of people, it's actually, uh, it's actually a very old trend that's now finally kind of coming to light because of the uh, ratio of uh, people of color in these towns that were once, you know, predominantly uh, white and, and monolithic. And so with that, I am going to turn this presentation, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to turn it over to Christina Palladino, who has some awesome questions set up for us already. Uh, to talk about with the panelists and I'll be going through the chat kind of looking at what folks have already said and and I'm sure I'll, I'll pop in and, and bring one of those questions in in a second. Great thank you so much Whitney and Josiah. Uh, congratulations on your capstone project and doing an excellent job here uh, walking us through your amazing report and the presentation. So if we could have all the panelists turn on their video that would be awesome. We're going to have a great discussion over the next hour or so. Uh, we're really going to dive deep into the report and get candid about 
um, just, you know, your story and perspectives from, you know, your line of work and your lived experience um, about, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in rural Minnesota. So uh, just a little bit about me. My name is Christina Palladino. Uh, I work for Park Street Public. We uh, work with the Center for Rural Policy and Development, um, and it's been great working with them. In a previous life, I was a television news reporter for close to 20 years, uh, most recently at Fox 9. So I've had the pleasure over my career uh, just you know, getting to know and becoming friends with many people from diverse backgrounds and traveling around the state uh, telling their stories. So um, this is just a, such a great topic and I'm really honored to be able to moderate this discussion. So I'd like to introduce our panelists and uh, after I introduce you, if you could maybe just say just a few words about yourself, a minute or two introduction, that would be great just for folks tuning in to get to know you a little bit better. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Obala Obala, the Austin City Councilman. Obala, just take a minute or two to tell everybody a little bit more about who you are. Oh, I think you're on mute there. I'm, yes, no. <laughs> we're still in that area where you, you yeah. don't know if you're still on mute. Yeah, right. well, thank you very much for um, this opportunity. My name is Obala Obala. Um, I live in Austin here and also a city council uh, man in Austin. A little bit about myself. I grew up in a refugee camp. And uh, before that, I fled my country, Ethiopia, because of genocide. And um, for the last uh, 10 years, I live in the refugee camp before I move here. So I've been in America for cl close to eight years now. So uh, in December, I will be eight years in America. And, um, and here I am in, I think choosing Austin was the best uh, choice ever because um, as a refugee, when you, when you move from a refugee camp, one thing in your mind, when you go to America, you live in a bigger town like New York City, you know, California, all those area, because we learn from movies, what we see in the movies. You're like, this is where I will be living when I go to America. But uh, once you come here, you see, nope, that's not the reality. Those big tall buildings, they are just offices. They are not homes. So when I moved here, we settled in Maryland, but things didn't go well. And then I have to move to South Dakota. From South Dakota, I finally found small town called Austin and here now where I am with my family and uh, it's been a great a blessing home. Wow, that's awesome. We could talk to you for hours about your experience. That's really great. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Martha Castagnon. She is with the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota and as Julie indicated earlier, she's also a board, board member of the Center for Rural Policy and Development. Martha, if you could just say a few words about yourself, that would be great. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Marta Castagnon, and I work with the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota. Um, I've been here for close to over six years in October. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I often, often call myself Minnesota homegrown um, because I was born and raised in Minnesota, but my parents um, met and married in this little town called Comstock, Minnesota, of all places. Um, and I, uh, my mother entered as a permanent resident from Mexico, um, and my father was born in Arizona, but raised in Mexico. And so when he was a young man, he took his birth certificate, went to the consulate in Guadalajara, Mexico, um, was given his passport and came into the United States and, um, um, made his way up to Minnesota. And so... Um, they met and married here, and um, all six kids of us were born here. I started first grade knowing only three words of English, hi, bye, and okay. Um, and in my prior life, I worked with, um, with the Southern Minnesota Regional Legal Services Migrant Legal Services Office that covered, um, that had legal services for migrant farm workers in the Red River Valley up here in Fargo, North Dakota. And I worked there for 35 years, but I also work as a farm worker in the fields. So that's my background right now. Great, thank you so much, Martha. And Sarah Karki, she is with the Austin Area Minority Business Project. Sarah, just a few words about yourself. Thank you so much to the Center for Rural Policy and Development for hosting this important conversation and to my fellow panelists for sharing your expertise on these issues. Um, my name is Sarah Karkey, and for the last 
four and a half years, I've been leading um, a project called Austin Area Minority Business Project, which is a collaboration um, between Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota, the Small Business Development Center in Austin, um, a research group and a private law firm called Ballard Spar um, that works together to provide both business and legal services for minority and immigrant entrepreneurs in and around Austin. Um, I grew up in the cities of Minnesota, but I've worked all over the state, um, Manoman, Worthington, now Austin. So um, it's, I have a little bit of an interesting perspective <laughs> um, being a Minnesotan who's been a newcomer in some of these cities. Thank you. Great. Well, first, I'd like to just kind of uh, generally start off a little round robin with everybody, just kind of giving, you know, an overall grade uh, of rural communities in Minnesota for how they welcome, accept, and interact with immigrants and refugees. So, Obala, let's start with you. Well, that's, that's a good question. And um, I think... Um, to give overall grade, I think I will I will be wrong if I go specific. But uh, from my uh, from my own uh, opinion, I think I will I will say each town it will uh, is different when we grade them. And uh, you know we can see, for example, if I want to talk about Austin, I think will be a little different with uh, a town you know nearby or like um, Lyle, you know, which is still part of Mon County. So I think um, from the last five years that I've been in Austin, I think if I want to grade, I will start with Austin. Where are we at now? I think I will say we are seven point five. And um, out of 10, I would say we are 7.5. Uh, that's on my experience since I moved here and how um, the Austin community, uh, those who we found here in Iraq with refugee and how, you know, how refugee felt when they moved to Austin, especially finding a job or looking for housing. Uh, but overall, if I will go uh, in most city, I would say we are in 5.5 overalls. Uh, Martha, what would what kind of a overall grade in general would you give rural communities right now with how they interact with immigrants and refugees? I am going to agree with Obala because it, it really depends on the size of the city and town. The larger the city is, the more it seems like it's more welcoming simply because there's more immigrants uh, moving into those areas. But the smaller the community area, is who may rarely see an immigrant family. Um, I would say it's a, it's a lower grade. So right now I would say maybe from seven and a half to an eight for the larger towns. Um, so yeah, I agree with Ubala that, that that's about how it is right now. Sarah? I was thinking B minus, but now hearing the other panelists, maybe move it down to like a C. <laughs> um, it really does depend on um, the individual people in the city and kind of who's reaching out. Um, I've heard this about Minnesotans in general is that we're not that welcoming. <laughs> um, someone explained it to me is like Minnesotans are nice, but they don't need any more friends. They still have all their friends from kindergarten. And in some ways, I think that's true. <laughs> um, so we really have to be intentional about being welcoming, especially to people um, who are very different than us. Um, so some cities are really making those extra efforts and some are not. They're um, being a little bit more closed off and like realizing there's people moving there, but not making that effort to really reach across and welcome people and get to know them. Yeah, and just for inclusion aspects, Whitney and Josiah, you guys obviously you know, study this and, and put the time in, just a quick grade of uh, some of these different communities. Yeah, I mean, I'd say, I, I think, I, I, maybe this is pessimistic, but I would say maybe like a C minus, I guess. Like I, I feel the intent is there, you know, in the interviewees, especially, so we mostly interviewed white folks who are working in the, the city and county government there's good intentions there, right? And they they do value the, the input of immigrants and refugees, but also um, I think sometimes, sometimes it's easier to fall back on like, oh, well, we don't speak the same language, so our hands are tied. 
right? And instead of looking at these more, um, instead of instead of looking at it like, okay, well, what are other solutions that that we can do to increase outreach? Like, uh, from my perspective, there's good intentions. They want their communities to be together, but there's kind of a narrow view of how to do that, and not a lot of thinking outside of the box. And that's like really what I'd like to see um, as these rural communities, you know, contend with um, having a having a diverse and yet uh, ideally cohesive community. Josiah, any kind of last thoughts on that? Uh, I would sort of opt out of the question and just sort of maintain my humility. You know, Whitney grew up in a rural area. I did not. Okay. I did one project uh, on rural Minnesota, and and I'm not going to be the, the academic who thinks he knows everything about about rural Minnesota from my. Uh, suburban Twin Cities home. I appreciate the honest answer. <laughs> so let's just talk about what do we do about some of these really small, you know, communities in towns that you guys are alluding to that just don't seem to really want to put in that extra effort to welcome people that look differently from them. Um, I'll kind of just give this to anybody who wants to jump in and answer that. Anyone? I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure what can be done. Um, sometimes in these smaller towns, you have communities um, that have been there for generations and sometimes change is hard. Um, and sometimes there's a mindset that well, we were able to do it so they can do it too and, and they'll be just fine, just like we did. Um, which is, you know, it's a good thing, but in the, uh, at the same time, it, it can cause, you know, even for a new family that moves into a totally rural town, they will find that mindset also. So it's not just immigrants um, who come across that. It could be a new uh, quote unquote, white family moving into a new town and they're the strangers, you know, and nobody knows who they are and where they're from. You know, they're not a family that has been there for generations. So um, I sometimes you can find some resistance and I don't, I'm not sure how to change that. And oftentimes what I've seen that it's often the children who cause that slow change, you know, the kids start playing with each other and you know, can I can I invite so and so for a sleepover? Or can I can he come over and have lunch with us? Or um, and slowly, I think it's really the children who uh, bring that change with the community. So, yeah. yeah, I love that, Martha. That's so true. Even just with my own two little girls, they play with anybody that wants to play with them, and it's really exactly cute. yeah. Well, Bala, I wanted um, to talk to you more. I mean, obviously, your story is just amazing. Um, and you shared a little bit with us, but what just attracted you to Austin? I mean, you kind of talked about, you know, you had first uh, moved to Maryland and it just didn't seem like to be a good fit. What eventually, you know, made you feel comfortable in Austin, Minnesota? Well, that's really a good question. And um, um, from my life experience, I grew up in a small village and um, living, uh, we live you know, across the river and um, our village is very small. And um, when we were in refugee camp, so we kind of have that mindset, you know, oh, uh, when we were back in the, in the, you know, in our villages, you know, things look better, you know, because you have that. But when we moved to Kenya, which is a bigger, um, um, a bigger country, which is, I, I, I cannot compare, Ethiopia is bigger uh, than Kenya, but we, we see how big town look like. So, and then for generation, most refugee, when they uh, come to America, I shared earlier, their mindset is that, oh, I wanna, I wanna live in a place that better than where I am now. You know, you were in refugee camp, everything is dust. So every, you know, you know, all the housing. So you have that mindset. When I go to America, I need to live in a certain area that that will um, give me a better life or something like that. But in reality, when uh, most refugee arrive here, uh, they see different things. 
um, like for my, uh, for example, when I, when we first settled in Maryland, you know, Maryland was a big city and then we were in Silver Spring and then for almost three, uh, three weeks, no one even come and visit us. And, uh, and the only person that we communicate with was our social worker. But think it start changing and uh, I hear from my other, uh, you know, friends, those who've been in Minnesota, other in other area, hey, you know, if you live within the bigger city, things are too expensive. And we live in a very uh, small two bedroom uh, apartment when we arrived and we were five in the family. So, and the rooms, they're so tight and uh, it was really difficult. And then we kind of realized uh, there's another part of Maryland, which is if you go to outside of Baltimore, uh, they have like those local town and that are whereby they have like, you know, bigger housing because, you know, those city, the housing that built there is for a long, long time ago. So, and they have not even changed. And for me, what attracted me to Austin was that when I, when I first moved to South Dakota, I get my stuff done and I can visit my mom here because my mom was here and I just fall in love with the town because you know you can just drive within five minutes you are outside of uh, of the community you know this there's no too much noise pollution you know whereby you can hear a lot of cars all those and um and the biggest thing that was that I did my research and I see like here in Austin there's a lot of jobs that if I compare them to a uh, job in Rochester or in Minneapolis, Austin pay more than those towns. And I'm like, I, 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 I was, I told my mom, if we stay here, I think we will get more opportunities. And, uh, and the, 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 the other thing that which a lot of immigrants are seeing now, they feel like if you go to town, people, those who live in a bigger town, they're already exhausted with, uh, you know, people coming in. So the rural area, you know, they're still new. So there are people who have, I want to know them, you know, I want to learn from them. So, and uh, in the other part. So what attracted me to Austin was that Austin was a small town. And I'm like, it's no different from my village. You know, it's a small town, you know, it's easy to know people. And, um, and the biggest thing that really made me to stick here was the people. Um, my first three months was Rivalent. Rivalent become a family right away. All the teachers, they're like, I'm like, if those teachers, they're like this at Rivalent, what about the community? So, uh, and then after three months, I'm like, let me go to the mayor. Let me search for the mayor. And then, uh, and that how it is because refugee, they are more likely to go to a smaller town where, you know, the job opportunity don't require uh, a lot of skills, you know, education because coming, for example, Hormel here on QPP. No one will ask you, do you have a bachelor degree? Do you have a high school diploma? You know, uh, my mom was able to get a job here at QPP uh, within, when she, or within one year, you know? And for me, it took me a little while, you know, um, to search for what kind of job do I want? You know, because I have to go to school. And, uh, you know, those are the opportunity most of the refugee, you know, attract to rural area because rural area has a better paying job and also housing too. Housing is more to be cheaper uh, in, in some part of rural area. Yeah, well, that's great because that leads into my next question for Sarah. What are some actionable steps local communities and governments can do to make sure various immigrant communities are integrated within society, whether that's housing like Obala talked about or you know some of those big employers that are in town? The question seems so broad. <laughs> um, I, I think that anyone will feel welcome when they feel connected. And that's the main thing. And how do people get connected? It's through the kids, um, it's through sharing a meal together or through sharing activities together. So um, I think some of the advantages of small towns, um, even though housing is such a crisis, um, because there isn't like, only one side of town where houses are for sale, um, the communities just get integrated. Like if there's a house on the block that's for sale, <laughs> whatever family that's ready to buy a house is gonna end up in that house. So um, you get communities that are very um, integrated in that way. And we also don't have like five different schools in these small towns. <laughs> All the kids are going to the same school together. So they're getting to know each other and how Martha was talking about the next generation getting it. Like I see that very clearly in Austin. I've gone to quinceañeras with 
children from all over the world represented in the court. <laughs> um, so the kids are definitely um, understanding how to work together while the adults are still trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, some great examples that I've seen um, are having the language infrastructure in place. So um, I know that there are some difficulties, um, especially with small towns, but there are language access laws that everyone needs to follow. <laughs> um, so really making sure you have those policies in place and it's not just, oh, we'll call a phone line or we'll make a child interpret, um, but actually having professional interpreters in place, um, it makes a big difference. And then once you have those basic needs met, kind of going above and beyond. So make sure that there is room for connection. Um, there's community activities, there's farmer's markets where everyone feels welcome and can buy vegetables that they are used to eating. <laughs> um, so it's great to learn about different food that I've never seen before. <laughs> I'm always asking about, you know, what, what is this vegetable? How can I cook it? And learning from the community members that are more familiar with them. So that makes a big difference. Um, in Austin and in Winona, um, some nonprofit groups have led um, opportunities to, to share a meal together. So it's literally being intentional about inviting a newcomer and inviting someone who's lived in town for a while <laughs> and getting them at the same table. And maybe they can't understand each other perfectly, but you know they can eat a meal together and they can play games like Jenga or <laughs> other games that don't require a lot of verbal um, communication. And that really helps to break down the barriers and start building those connections. Yeah. So some more things. I can pop in. Go ahead, Whitney. Go, go for yeah, it. Yeah. So we have some questions in the chat. There's one that stood out to me too. It, um, it's from Senator Tina Smith's office from, from Bree. And it's how can federal legislators create or continue to create policies around diversity and inclusion? And I would love to, to know if any of the panelists have a response to that. Um, our project was de definitely uh, looked at this from more of the local lens. And so I'm wondering, you know, do you have any ideas um, on, on the broader scale that uh, could help our rural communities in this effort to create uh, more cohesive communities? And if there's not a response, there's another question that I also have. And it's, uh, um, I put a little response. <laughs> um, some of you might have heard the Dreamers um, took another legal hit very recently. So really making a pathway. Um, so these kids who literally lived in the United States almost their entire lives, like actually have <laughs> um, a pathway to citizenship. That would be a great help. I know the Minnesota senators can't do it themselves, but <laughs> um, that would be a great start. Um, and the Office of Refugee Resettlement, um, they're providing services to the unaccompanied minors. And I was just learning today how limited the services are. Um, sometimes it's just one phone call after they get released from custody. And if no one answers that call, that's, that's all the services they get. And they're just kind of thrown into the wind <laughs> um, for whatever may or may not be available in the community um, they end up being in. Um, also, funding legal services, <laughs> making sure the USCIS, which is the government agency that handles immigration, is funded and has a someone acting at the head of it <laughs> um, for a while. Um, there wasn't anyone in that position, so it's been really difficult and people face really tremendous backlogs, um, both here and abroad, trying to reunite with families. And then I know Welcoming America has been um, working on a lot of national level policies, um, including um, offices for new Americans within the White House, um, just to really help um, make integrative policies and have funding for things like pathways to citizenship so that people can receive the education they need to get the legal status to make them um, citizens that will really help them be in society and have the same voice that everyone else does. Um, I, I can respond to that to add to uh, uh, what Sarah uh, just shared. Uh, I think the federal uh, government can do a lot. For example, um, in 2018, 2019, as a student, we advocate for DACA um, and the, the Dreamer, which is, you know, we went to federal level um, whereby we talked to senators, Congress to, you know, to pass that Dream Act, you know, if, um, because we have, we learned that that time uh, we have more than um, um, 60,000, you know, uh, you know, uh, 
immigrant, those who are, or those who are dreamers within the college system. So, and, and when when we learn about that, we took it as a big um, uh, issue, and then we advocate here on a state level, and also we took it to the federal level. And that the other thing is um, um, is helping like refugee, like simplifying like FAFSA, you know, when they go through college, you know, but that's one thing we advocate at federal level. I remember a visit with Senator. Uh, Tina Smith before, and I talked with uh, Senator uh, Amy Klobuchar about how we can do uh, to help um, simplify, uh, you know, FAFSA because you know for most refugee, you know, when they when they started here, is is really like a lot of questions. Some they don't even have those information, and it was really difficult to uh, finish through, and also and also you know um, having that opportunity, and they're missing out going to college. So after that, we were able to, they simplified a little bit, but still there are a lot of work to do uh, to have those opportunities uh, for FAFSA to be simplified so that immigrant can be easily for them to get those grants and also get those federal loans and, and other stuff. So those are the um, some few uh, things that the federal level can focusing on and also help other refugees. And the other thing, biggest thing is, um, what can we do? Because we have seen in the past few years, the refugee, uh, you know, uh, is declining coming to America. So this is something uh, the federal level can work on to, uh, you know, to put this because a lot of refugee, you get your case and then you stay in a refugee camp waiting for almost seven years for you to be approved. So if there is something can faster that, I think that would be one thing that will be really amazing for the refugee in uh, as they move to uh, America. Yeah. Yeah, so to bring it back to like the local level, does Obala or Martha, do you have any stories that you could share um, that reflect how uh, immigrant or refugee representation in local governments, how, how has that like reshaped any conversations in local areas? Like, have you ever seen an instance where, you know, even with Obala, right? Like you getting on the council, like how, have you seen any actionable instances of representation, like changing a conversation or moving a conversation in, in a different way? Yeah, I, I have seen a lot. And uh, for example, within Austin uh, community, before I even um, joined the city council, um, I, I feel like everything was like great from inside, but uh, you know, being on that table to learn and come back and be like, this is what the city work on. This is, you know, because some of the refugees, you know, uh, all those law that pass within, you know, the city council don't reach out to them as easy like that, you know? And uh, for me, I think what really, um, chain for the last uh, few years that I've been in Austin here, especially being an honorary city council, I have learned so much, you know, encouraging those um, um, refugee to speak up, you know, because um, uh, one thing that I, I, I know for refugee, refugee, they're more, uh, you know, reserved. And if no one come and ask them, they don't even say anything, even if something. So, and the last few years, especially last year, uh, for example, uh, when we had, um, when pandemic started, you know, the city council was able to pass, uh, you know, um, uh, through the human rights commission when uh, like the, when uh, Asian, you know, uh, anti-Asian community, you know, so that was like a big thing. So the, the Human Rights Commission of Austin was able to um, have, start that conversation so that uh, the city council can pass a proclamation because a lot of our Asian community, they feel afraid that they are targeted, you know, that all oh, your, you, this, you know, this uh, virus is bring by you or you are, you know, uh, cause of this and blah, blah, blah. So even though we didn't see a lot of cases in Austin, you know, Austin was able to um, pass through that uh, and pass that uh, proclamation. And that was done because within those, um, uh, within those meeting, there, there are immigrants, those who are speaking up. This is what we are seeing, you know, on, this, on the city council, those what we are seeing in the community and uh, those what we are seeing uh, outside of the community. So, and for me personally, I think um, the housing issue uh, within Austin, this is something that I have been so passionate about it, and uh, I've been, uh, you know, 
um, talking about the childcare, you know, because before that, I have learned that, you know, a lot of immigrant community, you know, they are really affected by the childcare issue then because we don't have daycare that they can take their kid to. Some of them, they're afraid, like I cannot afford that one. And one thing that we are still having a conversation now with the city administration and other city council, what can we do to have like a daycare that can uh, help um, a lot of immigrant within, within that. So, and I feel like me being there pushing for those, you know, conversation has really brought a lot of research and uh, we see a lot of work done by our uh, uh, city clerk, Craig, and he always like looking out for new resources. Hey, Obala, we have seen this somewhere. What can we do uh, to help? So I think those are the, the few things that I have known and I can give opportunity to other people. That's great. Thank you, Obala. Uh, one of the questions we got um, in the chat from folks tuning in from Marlene Lundberg, I thought it was really nice the way she said it. Cultural change is necessary for a community to be welcoming and inclusive. The question is, how can the culture be changed? And Martha, you kind of alluded to this earlier. It might start with children. Uh, just talk about how the younger generation seems to be much more equipped to do this. They're more progressive um, and they might be the answer to how we figure this out. Martha, you're muted. Um, I think for children, it seems to come natural that they, they're curious for one, um, and they wanna play. And so if the next, if the family that moved next door is a family that uh, came from Ghana um, and the child sees the children playing outside, they're naturally curious that they're, they're, they're gonna to wanna to play with each other. And I think that's how it starts, that they start playing with each other and um, they each go back to their individual families and talk about how I played with so-and-so. So they don't see color. I mean, they really don't see it. Um, I think one of the changes that can be done is something as simple as you're out for a walk um, you see the family outside and you stop and say hello and you chit chat for a little bit. Those are the little things. It's those little things that kind of blossom into bigger things. Um, and I think that's how those, those very small communities have to start is bringing that change and having the family feel more welcoming um, and getting to know them and hearing their story and realizing that they're just, they're just like us, you know, they have, they have children to take care of, they've got their ups and downs, um, that kind of stuff. And, and they're gonna learn that their, their refugee immigrant story is not much more different than when their ancestors came many, many years ago looking for a better life. And those families, their ancestors also had struggles with, um, with the culture and with the language. Um, I remember as growing up, I would hear some of the stories that my friends would tell of how their great grandparents struggled with language and, and facing discrimination, disparate treatment because um, they didn't speak the English language and they spoke German or Swedish. Um, so they'll learn that the stories kind of are the same at the end, so. I want to get your viewpoint as well as Obala's. How has the pandemic and the racial reckoning that happened in Minneapolis after the murder of George Floyd made the situation better or worse for immigrants and refugees in, in rural communities? Martha? I think for the pandemic, um, because of the restrictions that were out there, it was really hard for communities to communicate. Um, so now that the restrictions are, are gone, um, I think people are starting to get back into, you know, conversing with each other and getting to, to know each other. But um, I think it affected everybody. The pandemic affected everybody. In regards to the racial reckoning, um, I think for the communities out in Western North Dakota, they, they have started having those conversations about, um, about treatment and the history and um, and the disparate treatment and um, 
for me and for some of my acquaintances, um, it's really hard for local folks to realize how they're treating somebody differently. Um, they will say, oh, I'm not racist, but that bias is so in there. And let me give you an example. Um, and I used to hear this a lot when I worked with legal services was that in Fargo, North Dakota, I live right on the border, which is Moorhead. So right across the river is Fargo, North Dakota that has Marvin windows and other um, factories. And so there's a lot of Latinos um, and other immigrant work groups that work in these factories. And um, I would have had friends tell me, me están discriminando, they're discriminating against me. And I would ask, well, how is it? And she said, well, you know, I've been there for years. I keep applying for a higher level position. I never get it. But yet this young woman who has been there three years less than I have, she got moved up, you know, and we both, I was always on time, never late. Those are the things that I would hear about. Or say, for example, um, you've got two co-workers. One is white, one is Latina. Um, both come in late on different days for whatever reasons, car wouldn't start or something with childcare or sick child. The Latina gets written up, but not the, the other co-worker. And those are the things that most employers don't realize that they're treating they don't see it as being racist, but that bias is so deep down inside. Um, and how do you explain it? I mean, you've got um, employees of color who feel like they're being discriminated against, but the employer doesn't see it that way. And how do you explain it? How do you start having that conversation? Because, you know, because if you bring it up, they get very um, defensive and say, well, I'm not racist but they don't realize that they're doing it when they treat their employees differently. So those are the things that I've seen. Um, here in Moorhead, it's very, it, it's harder for, for um, people of color to start up community, to start a business simply because of the rules that are in place, the codes that are in place, Fargo has tons of um, grocery store businesses and restaurants um, and other businesses that have been started by people of color, but here in Moorhead, you know, and if you go up and down the valley to the border cities, um, you will find that there's more businesses of color on the North Dakota side than there are on the, on the Minnesota side because of the rules that are in place. It seems like it's more difficult like to open up a restaurant, you gotta have all these codes in place and everything has to be up to code and it's very expensive. Um, so those are some of the things that I'm seeing here. Um, yeah. I think the schools are doing a lot better to be more inclusive hiring staff um, of color. I would like to see more teachers and more school counselors of, of different ethnicities in the schools because I think it's very much needed. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, yeah, that's what I have to say right now, so. Yeah, no, thank you. Obala, in your viewpoint, do you feel like the racial reckoning has made things better or worse where you are? I, I, I think in my area in Austin is um, a, a wake up call uh, especially what happened in Minneapolis um, after the George Floyd. Uh, for the first time in history, Austin has done uh, a rally um, within within town. I think that's what I learned from the people who have been here long enough um, because before we started and um, the protest, it was not a protest, but uh, speaking up, it was young, uh, young men and women, those who started, uh, they're like, before it happened here, we have to do something to show solidarity with the uh, with the Floyd family. And um, I, I think before that, the community responded in a different way. So that if this uh, rally will go on, uh, the business will be burned down or our downtown will be burned down and and so and so. And before I was 
because I was campaigning. I was caught in a different situation. I was campaigning and then I didn't want to be the target that, oh, you are doing this because you're running for office. So, and then um, the organizer, they called me. They're like, hey, Wally, you want to come? We will have this, you know, uh, um, uh, rally coming up. We want to show solidarity and, you know, uh, and do a little walk around in Austin uh, for George Floyd. So before I said to myself, should I go or no? Because I know for sure, like what happening is the worst thing. And, um, and it could be me or it could be anyone. But the last minute, some of my friends, they're like, hey, let's just go and stand back and, and uh, you know, and watch them. So all of the kit. And then I went there. I saw everyone like old, some kid there from like two years and they are there. And uh, I was just standing behind and before they take off, before they take off to come to the, you know, downtown, um, you know, they were talking, this is, we, we don't want to see any another uh, police kill another black man, you know, you know, everyone having that discussion. So, and um, they give me opportunity to say some few words. And one thing that I say during that speech, um, I, I told everyone that Austin is my home and uh, I don't want to be another uh, refugee to run away from Austin. So I know all of you who come to this uh, rally or protest, you are not here to destroy any property. Uh, you are not here to um, fight with anyone, but we are here to show solidarity and, uh, and tell the uh, Austin community that we support the good police, those who are doing the service for our community but we disagree with those police who take advantage of their position to do harm to other community member, either you are, you are black or you are white. So uh, it was a big response from the community. It went as a positive. So I told everyone we will be through this rally until the end. And the good thing was that the police the police in our community, the police department, the law enforcement, they send some of their, uh, you know, law enforcement to guide us through. That was one thing I'm like, wow, if, if this is, this could not be happening in Minneapolis or other town, you know, we, we are protesting against police brutality and the police, they're showing up to support us. They're kneeling down with us. They're guiding the way with us. And uh, that's what I tell uh, uh, our young folks that, we are seeing unity here. Um, it doesn't mean that if uh, one police kills someone in Minneapolis, that means this po one police here in Austin will do the same thing or support that, you know, because we don't know what in there, but I know for sure our police here in Austin will not think of doing that. So that process went in a positive way and it bring up a lot of conversation after that. I, I was waiting on Facebook. I didn't sleep that night. I was just waiting. Maybe someone will throw something or and then take advantage of our rally. And then I didn't sleep. I was up on my Facebook all night after the rally. And in the morning, I see a different feed on my Facebook. Everyone was like, thank you for everyone for, you know, doing the protest in the right way. Austin is doing positive. Even the people that who I see, they were, uh, you know, on the other side before, those who are concerned that uh, thing will be destroyed. So, and I'm like, this is what the community uh, look like. This is how a unity, a welcoming community look like. So, and through seeing them, we had a lot of conversation within the community and, uh, and uh, I have a lot of talk with our chief of police. Uh, uh, every time I hear something uh, within other town, I will call them and see what is your perspective? How 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 do you see this? You know, and he will give me from his. And the good thing, with seen last year, I have seen a lot of positive thing coming from our police chief, uh, Chief Mc, um, Keegan, uh, if uh, about how they could respond. Like for example, what happened to. Um, uh, in Brooking Park. So I have seen our police chief bring detail how that could be prevented and how that could go in a, in a way that teaching the community how the police sometimes they can respond in this way. I think Austin has really uh, woke up through that because uh, and now we need more discussion, you know, so that uh, everything that uh, um, other African American or Black people uh, uh, going through is affecting the immigrant too. It's affecting the refugee who are here. So, and that's why now we have to continue this conversation so that 
nothing can happen. And overall, I think it's a learning opportunity for everyone. I got to sit down with uh, other people. And now, uh, you know, we are working on a different project, how to be having a welcoming community. That's excellent. We know that representation matters, whether it's in local government, law enforcement, business community, in schools. Uh, I'll do a little round robin here. What do you guys think needs to be done better to make sure that happens so that more people, you know, see someone like Obala on the council and say, I want to do that too. How do I go about doing that? Sarah, any thoughts? Yeah, I wanted to comment briefly on the last question as well. Great, yeah. Um, I think that both COVID and the racial reckoning have really been polarizing for greater Minnesota. Um, so in some ways it's been a, oh, that's a Minneapolis problem and we're doing fine here, we're so great. <laughs> um, and then others have really like taken it as an opportunity to look at, and see like, oh yeah, we do have diversity, but look at our graduation rates in Austin among certain communities aren't that great. Um, so I, I think it's really been kind of a tale of <laughs> um, two different viewpoints um, with regards to the racial reckoning. And then with COVID as well, um, a lot of the immigrants and refugees have really been disparately impacted because they've been working on the lines and as essential workers this entire time. Um, so then there's differing viewpoints about, you know, how bad is it? Or should we get vaccines or not? So there, it's really been polarizing on a lot of levels. And I know that as Obala referenced, um, there has been a lot more incidents of um, racial discrimination or just racial slurs being um, directed towards Asian people because of where the virus came from. So I know that that's brought out more racism in some ways. So it's been very polarizing um, and it's been good to see how some of the communities are really reaching out and trying to strengthen and make sure everyone has access to health information in a language that they're comfortable in and making the vaccines as easy to get to as possible, going to parks, going to the schools, um, having them in the parking lot at work, like wherever <laughs> um, they can get this um, health information to people and opportunities for vaccines. Um, as far as getting people involved in um, honorary city council programs or boards and commissions, um, I think it really takes leadership from within the city. Um, so like Obala said, Craig Clark is on and he's been really a great champion of the honorary city council program and um, the Human Rights Commission did a great job setting some of these programs up. Um, but it's not just like, oh, we're appointing a token member to be on whatever board. Like you have to really be open to listen to what they say. <laughs> um, if they do agree to give your, their time and come to your meeting or <laughs> whatever, um, really respect the time that they're giving and be open and welcoming because it's one thing if you say that you're welcoming <laughs> and look, this is so great. We have someone from a different experience on with us, but if you discount everything they say or don't believe <laughs> um, what facts they're telling you, they're not gonna feel, feel welcome and they're not gonna wanna waste their time coming back. So really making sure that they have allies on whatever board or commission they're on, um, they understand the rules, um, you know, when I was on the board, I would always try to meet with people before the first meeting, make sure they understood the rules, kind of go over <laughs> uh, the politics a little bit, kind of what it's like on the commission, how we operate, and find out what their interests are to make sure that we were meeting it too. Martha, you mentioned, you know, you're seeing better, um, you know, examples from schools. Uh, what else would you like to see from schools and you know businesses and the business partnership in your area? I think um, what I can say for involvement is uh, the school board in the Moorhead School District um, has seen an increase of people of color running for the board, which I think is fantastic. Um, but I haven't seen it for the city council um, or for the county. The county commission, there was one person and they lost. Um, but I think for the local co immigrant communities, sometimes 
there has to be that one person to take that first step in order for others to get involved. And um, I, uh, I was one of those persons that took that first step. So, so um, when the opportunity came up to serve for the Center for Rural Development, that they needed somebody from this area, I thought, okay, what the heck, why not? Let's, let's go for it, and, and I'm on. Um, and I'm very glad of the fact that not only as a person of color, but also representing Northwest Minnesota. Um, here in Moorhead, I got on the, on the uh, committee for the city charter, um, and there's very few people of color serving on the local committees. And, it, and that's what it takes is maybe for strong leadership um, and for others to see, well, you know, we need to get more people involved, like in the in the several committees that the city has. And um, and I tell people, you know, if you're that concerned about what's going on at the parks, you need to bring it up to the park commission or the human rights commission as to what's going. And if you don't like how it's 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 running, then get involved, you know. But um, there's many that don't want to say anything because they want to leave it to the next person. I don't want to be one of those persons that complains and doesn't do anything. So I'd rather serve on something and hopefully um, be able to make some change. Yeah, that's great. I want to make sure we get this question in from Miguel Octavio from ABC6, K-A-A-L-T-V. Um, and I think this is a, does a really good job of kind of wrapping up this uh, webinar and kind of facing forward here. Uh, he says, as you mentioned, not everyone sees the importance of welcoming our immigrant and refugee communities in rural areas. Why does building relationships and embracing differences make the community stronger overall? Obala, you want to take this one home for us? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Let me, may you repeat the question again? Sure. He says, as you mentioned, not everyone sees the importance of welcoming our immigrant and refugee communities in rural areas. So why does building relationships and embracing differences make the community stronger overall? Oh, that's that's really, really good question. And um, I think I think making relationship um, is make the community stronger in so many ways. And uh, one thing that I have to mention, refugee and immigrant, when they move to America, they are hungry for change. They're hungry for success. They're hungry for anything that make their life better. And uh, for, for them, you know, um, what the only thing that they need is the little connection, the little welcome that they see from the host of the community. And, uh, um, and, and to have them um, their voice heard that, hey, I can do this part uh, while I'm here. So uh, I think it's really important if we want to build a stronger community, um, every voice needs to be, you know, uh, present on the table. And uh, I think, for example, um, within Austin community here, um, the connection we have you know, um, building those relationships, like what we have now, like uh, the work that Human Rights Commission is doing with the city council, the, the, the city council working with the county together, you know, and uh, appointing all those, um, you know, immigrant, those who have um, less resources to be part of those leadership, you know, uh, when uh, uh, everyone who appointed as an owner city council or those who appointed on um, zoning uh, commission, Anything they learn there, they take it back to their community and be like, see, this is what I learned. And then from there, encourage other uh, immigrants be like, okay, I want to go back and um, be in your position too and learn something uh, the same. So those, those are the things that when we have more of them involved, you know, it open more opportunity so within, uh, uh, within the, the community and uh, also building that uh, relation in a way that not not only um, um, you know building the economy, also you know making sure that everyone in that area has a voice on the table. I don't know if I answered uh, the right way, so I can give opportunity to um, Martha to uh, say a part of that. No, I think you were great. And Martha, we have a, about a minute or so, so if you would just quickly, uh, and then we can kind of wrap up after that. That'd be great. Um. Going back to Miguel's question that he posted, um, 
I, I do realize that not everyone, not every community sees the importance of being welcoming, but I think sooner or later, they're gonna realize that it's the immigrant community that's helping their communities um, thrive and become larger. Um, so it may take some time, but they'll get there eventually. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, um, they have to be open. They have to be open to embracing change in their communities. And for some, it's harder than others. Yeah, it's really well said. Well, thank you so much, everyone, to our amazing panel, Obala, Martha, Sarah, Whitney, and Josiah. I thought this was a great discussion. Obviously, we could talk about this for uh, so much longer, but uh, I really appreciate you being a part of this this afternoon. It was a privilege to moderate this discussion again, and I'm going to hand it back over to Julie to wrap things up. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for moderating another wonderful panel. And uh, gosh, thank you to our panelists for your candidness. Greatly appreciate that we could talk for hours on this, and I hope that we can do this again in the future. Um, you know, this is a, a good first step. And uh, thank you to Whitney and Josiah and rest of their team for doing this project. And again, to the Humphrey School, um, I know that Whitney is going to be following up on this project. And so, you know, we're here to put that research out and to bring people together and to talk about these things. And so hopefully this spurred some uh, conversation in your mind and you can go out into your communities and do those small things and get people involved. Um, I would be remiss if I don't mention to make sure you go to our website on ruralmn.org and you can see the full report there. Um, also all of our other reports as well. So, and then also this recording will be up on our YouTube channel, Center for Rural Policy and Development in the next couple of days. So thank you all so much. I hope that you can tune in in the future and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you.